We just sang, Eitz Chaim He. It is a tree of life to those who hold fast to it, and all who support it are happy. When I was a kid growing up in Tenafly, New Jersey, just outside of New York City, I too was part of a youth choir at Temple Emeth, and it was called Eitz Chaim. Ever since then, these words have had a special place in my heart. It's a metaphor that seems to do justice to the otherwise impossible to summarize, the scope, span, and sustaining spirit of Judaism and Torah. A tree reaches upward to the heavens, producing fruit for nourishment, absorbing sunlight into green and multicolored leaves. For me, this upward growth symbolizes the aspirations that Judaism lays out to me and how I might always achieve new spiritual heights. Of course, a tree also digs deep roots, establishes its history, which gives it the power to withstand storms and winds. I know that I can forever explore my roots, this span of collected Jewish tradition, and find meaning and sustenance. And so I love this metaphor, Eitz Chaim, the Torah is a tree of life. But these words were wounded, this byword was bloodied, and this metaphor was marred. On October 27, 2018, with the tragic events at the Tree of Life, or the Simcha Synagogue, in Squirrel Hill of Pittsburgh, and the murder of 11 Jews killed in the very act of holding fast to it, to Torah, the Tree of Life. In the Jewish vocabulary, there is a single word that captures our immediate reaction to such a moment. Echa. How? How come? How is it so? How do we proceed? How is God involved? How is God absent? How was a 97-year-old woman named Rose a threat to anyone? We have a whole book in the Bible called Echa, this, this special kind of how. And in English, we call this book the Book of Lamentations. We leave its recitation for Tisha B'Av, a day that is solely dedicated to mournfulness and lamentation. But Yom Kippur is a more expansive and more awesome day. It contains the full range of human emotion, from sadness to joy, from mourning to dancing. In my remarks, I will dig a little deeper into the former, into sadness. But I hope that by the end of this sermon, we also bring into view the joy and hopefulness that are just as much a part of this redemptive day. A lament is something we're not quite used to. It's a crying out without a solution suggested, without consolation conferred. Rather, echa is a question without an answer, an exclamation that doesn't provide direction. If you are able from where you are seated, I invite you to read with me the lament that will be projected above which I wrote in the days following the Pittsburgh shooting, like our classic laments in his acrostic spelling out, Tree of Life. Torah is a tree of life to those who grasp it, yet all who hold it are hated. Roses, mortal flowers, they ought to die one day with a gentle, noble decay, each petal falling one by one, exceeding 97, were it not for the killer and his gun, ending the life of a minion and a rose, 11 fresh graves where frigid stones must go. Of moments such as these, Zion cries out, Echa, how, in utter disbelief. Forget old Lang Syne, those olden days serene, Jewish American blood once unforeseen. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, Unalienable rights, self-evident truth. In this troubled age, creator, where is the hero or sage who must come quickly in our days? For we are crying, our police are crying, our brothers and sisters are crying, crying Echa. Another cry. <clears throat> it's now almost a year since we all in our own way said Echa. Some cried it, some whispered, some wondered and some cursed. Echa how? It's almost a year of Kaddish for those 11, and we can't adequately memorialize them today, though I know their home communities will. 
It's now almost a year since their synagogue building itself was devastated. And did you know that the building remains shuttered, surrounded by a fence? The congregants are meeting in other locations around Pittsburgh for these holy days. We can't purify their building from here. It's now almost a year since Eitz Chaim He, this beloved metaphor, has been so tainted. But perhaps it is in my power and our power to help purify just that, just those words. The Talmud records that in the ancient temple ritual, a scarlet thread would become white if the Yom Kippur ritual was successful. So how do we make our bloody tree of life return to its vibrant green? In fact, the rest of the verse gives us an answer. It is a tree of life to whom? It's a tree of life to those who hold fast to it. We need to hold fast to our Torah. In my moment of lament when I wrote that poem, I asked for a hero or sage who could, perhaps like that ancient, powerful temple priest, take care of this for me, take care of it for all of us. But a year later, we know that an act of devastation can only be answered by a thousand acts of chesed, a thousand acts of kindness. Our community in Pittsburgh, in New York, and I know here as well, received and gave 1,000 acts of kindness after the tragedy. In Pittsburgh, Jew and non-Jew alike, sports teams of, of opposing demeanor, they rallied around the, the slogan, stronger than hate. That together, America's loving portion is stronger than it's hateful. No hero or sage can fulfill this for us. But rather, as we read in our Torah portion, atem nitzavim kulchem hayom. You who stand here today, all of you, regardless of age or occupation or station, all have it in your power to observe these teachings. The teaching is very close to you, says Moses. It is already in your mouth and in your heart. So when the shootings at Pittsburgh occurred or Poway, San Diego, or outside of the Jewish community at Christchurch or Charleston or elsewhere, we usually don't need new instructions. We just need to continue acting upon our teachings. These wicked people are often publishing online their new manifestos, but we are not a manifesto type of people making simple proclamations. Judaism is about show, don't tell. Not manifestos, but manifesting our commitments, our kindness through deeds. Grabbing hold of our tree of life, our Torah, in which study, in which study must lead to action. If our grasp was flimsy, we'd have stopped coming to synagogue a long time ago. Though I know thousands of you came to the vigil immediately following, and you are here to gathered again today, holding fast. If our grasp was flimsy, we wouldn't check in on a sick neighbor or a mourning friend. But I've already witnessed in my time here how deeply this community looks out for each other and holds fast to each other. If our grasp was flimsy, we'd bristle at the inconveniences of increased security. But holding fast means supporting the financial burden and enduring the psychological burden of this re reality and showing gratitude to those that secure us. Holding fast means making the extra effort to meet Judaism's demands for justice throughout our society. As Isaiah articulated in our Haftarah, unlock the shackles of injustice, loosen the ropes of the oppressed, and share bread with the hungry. Isaiah also tells us, that holding fast means honoring and remembering the Sabbath and calling it Oneg Shabbat, calling it a delight. That's not always easy for us, even for us clergy. So I'll share a simple story which reminded me of what happens when we hold fast to the Torah that's already upon our lips and in our hearts. Just a small act that I think brought happiness forward. A few weeks after beginning here, my girlfriend was visiting for the first time and on her first Friday afternoon, within the whirlwind of work, we managed to accomplish the small but significant feat of having a meal cooked and the table set for two before returning to temple for Shabbat services. After services, we walked back to my nearby home. Just two blocks from my home crossing the streets, I did a double take, thinking that I'd recognize someone. 
But in my excitement to get back to my Shabbat meal, I ignored that double take sensation and shied away from an encounter. But a voice called out, Tobias? And sure enough, it was a camp counselor that I'd worked with at a Jewish summer camp in Colorado. The counselor had been just an acquaintance, not more than that. But we stopped to chat, of course, and like me, she had just moved to Minneapolis. We marveled at that, that coincidence, but truthfully, honestly, my attention wasn't with her. My attention was going back towards my house two blocks away, to an intimate meal, an overdue catch-up, and time away from the new pressures of this public rabbinical role. But then, that Torah-infused conscious of mine. Like Pinocchio, we all have this Jewish Jiminy Cricket inside of us, calling out. Moses says it a little differently. He says the instruction is already upon our hearts and our lips. So mitzvot, commandments, Jewish values start flying across our brains at these kinds of occasions. Some also call it Jewish guilt. But these mitzvot, these commandments, these values of hospitality, of welcoming someone new to town, of making the Sabbath a delight and sharing Shabbat dinner, they came into my mind. And so I grabbed hold of that little piece of Torah. I invited her to join us for dinner at that moment, and we reset the table for three. It was a very small act, but most of life is responding to small moments, thankfully. Small opportunities. I didn't solve a great ethical dilemma, didn't give some great sum of money to tzedakah. But now that Shabbat guest is no longer just an acquaintance, but one of my first friends in the cities. She's been back for another meal, she came here for Rosh Hashanah, and by grabbing hold of this little piece of Torah, it brought more joy into my world, and I think to hers as well. The rabbis are famous for saying mitzvah gorer mitzvah. A mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. Acts of loving kindness self-propagate, and joy ripples through a society. Now, earlier I promised that Yom Kippur is known to tradition as a joyous day. In fact, there's a comparison between Yom HaKippurim and Purim. Not going into that connection, I'll go into another way that the rabbis spell out this joy. The Talmudic rabbis said that there's simply a joy inherent with the possibility of repentance and finding forgiveness. But an earlier stage provides a specific il illustration of what joy used to look like on Yom Kippur. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel records the following tradition. There were no days of joy in Israel greater than Tu Ba'av, Jewish Valentine's Day for short, and Yom Kippur. On these days, anyone seeking a mate would dress in white gowns and go out into the fields. The gowns they were wearing, they all had to be borrowed. No one could wear their own gown. This way, no one would know who was rich, who was poor, who was from royal or priestly descent, and who was a common Israelite. These white-wearing singles would go dance in the vineyards and meet their suitors. Who would think that the Day of Reckoning could have such romance? That the earliest J-date occurred on Judgment Day <laughs> and with a flirtatious dance. Now we do things a little bit different at Temple. It's just us clergy wearing these white robes and the Torah scrolls themselves, but we won't do any flirtatious dance, I promise. That comes in a week with Simchat Torah. But on this day, joy does come into focus in our community. After Kol Nidre's awe of last night, after our introspection this morning, after the healing and memorial services this afternoon, during Yom Kippur's climactic conclusion, during the Ila, we'll bring up all the new babies of the congregation this year. They are our dancing joy, our reminder of joy on this Yom Kippur. Rabbi Jeffrey Meyer, the Tree of Life Synagogue rabbi, who many of us saw on the news, asks a classic question. What is the most important day of the Jewish year? His answer is it's the day after Yom Kippur, the day when we begin to choose, will our grasp on Torah be flimsy or held fast? That seems to me to be why Yom Kippur was once a day for finding your mate and now is a day to celebrate babies and the next generation. We are celebrating tomorrow and all the coming opportunities, big and small, all the coming opportunities to hold fast to the tree of life and show that all of its supporters bring happiness into the world.
שנה טובה.